Has everybody had their moment? You know, do you get a moment where something happens and you make that commitment, I won't let go? And I mean, it's like an epiphany. It's not like I, I decide, oh, somebody showed me the Sabbath, I believe it's right, and so I keep the Sabbath. Or somebody showed me that I should be doing this, and I do it. Somebody showed me, and I do it. I'm talking about something that happens deep down inside you. Like something happens. Many, many years ago, because I've been walking this walk a long time, you know, I, I lived in an apartment, and the, very rarely did we use the front door because uh, it wasn't as convenient as the back door. And there were the, to get to the front door, there was this very steep flight of steps. And so one day, I almost fell down them. But the way was narrow, so I was able to catch myself on the wall. And I knew, looking at the bottom of that stairwell, that had I fallen, I would be dead. There's just, I just knew it. There's just, you, you just, I just knew it. And instead of the first thing, I mean, that thought came to me, and then I was like, okay, Yahweh, why'd you save me? What, you got something. What, 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 what's up? I know it was him that saved me, and I knew there was a purpose to that. But I had been walking with Yahweh for a while when that incident happened. Unlike Sister Denise's was very physical, her near-death experience. Mine was, I just knew it. I didn't have to, I, I just knew it. And then one day, several years later, when the world was crashing all around me, and I didn't know up from down, and I was falling apart, and I had a Bible while I was crying like this. And my husband at the time was trying to take it from me so that he could hold me. And I was like, no, this is all I got. I'm talking about an epiphany like that, where it doesn't matter what's this, I won't let go. Because what I know is there's nothing else. There's nothing else. And I can't even though this is a book, at that moment, this was Yahweh. And I couldn't let you have it. You can't have it, you can't take it from me, because this is all I got. This is all I got. Have you had that moment? We're not just singing words. Have you had the moment? Have you had that moment where I won't let you go, yeah. I won't let you go. Why? Because you satisfy me. You satisfy me. That's not my message, but you satisfy me. I'm going to start and read it kind of flows together. Nehemiah 8, starting at verse 1, going through verse 10. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which Yahweh had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood, I'm not going to say all those names, they're Levites. Okay, they're all Levites. Verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people.
for he was above all the people, kind of like this. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed Yahweh, the great God. And all the people answered, amen, amen, with lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshiped Yahweh with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Benai, again, a bunch of names that are all Levites, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book of the law of Yah distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which, which is the Tish, Tirshatha, the governor, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto Yahweh your God. Mourn not, weep not. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, Send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. We sang the uh, restore the joy question in there. Have you become weary? Well, actually, the statement says we have become weary. Have you become weary? Are you weary? The scripture says, for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. What is the joy of Yahweh? See, we read stuff like that and say, yeah, yeah, okay. But what is the joy of Yahweh? See, I read this stuff and I want to know, like, okay, if the joy of Yahweh is my strength, I want to know what the joy of Yahweh is, right? So you can do an internet search. Like I know we all do, you know, if something pops in our head and we go on the internet and you can find pros and cons on every topic, far out philosophies, and this is no different. So, um, you know, they usually start with the difference between happiness and joy, which is a good place to start because happiness is surface, you know, things make you happy, and, you know, but the joy, it's like, I got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart. You know, it's something that's like down inside you. Happiness is fleeting. You know, but when the joy is down inside you, even when you're going through hardships, you can look up and say, hallelujah, because there's a joy inside, okay? So there is, that's important to know, and so there were some articles that, made the distinction between what is happiness and joy, and some are very philosophical. And some say if you have Yeshua, you automatically get it. Uh, In all these, it is usually interpreted to mean the joy that Yahweh puts inside me, Uh, the joy, the fruit of the Spirit, the joy I have. But this is not what it says. It says the joy of Yahweh, the joy he has, not the joy we have from him, but his joy. So there's a distinction here, not not this fruit of the spirit, which is good. We want this joy. We want that joy, 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 joy down in my heart, right? We want that. But this joy of Yahweh is something different. We know that Yahweh is love, and we accept that readily. His nature is love. The scripture says Yahweh is love. Not he has love, but he is love. And so since his nature is love, everything that flows from him proceeds from a place of love. But the scriptures also tell us that Yahweh is a jealous God, right? I need to give you some scriptures, Exodus 20, I am a jealous God. Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 4, 24. 
It also says that he can be an angry God, right? So uh, it says in Psalm 711, it says, and Elohim is angry with the wicked every day. Every day he's angry with the wicked. Deuteronomy 32, 21 says, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. In other words, they're an idolatry. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. It also says he hates, right? Proverbs 6, everybody knows this, right? 16 through 19, these six things that Yahweh hate, yea, seven, are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift to running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Things that Yahweh hates, that's good, right? That, because from that view, what did we, the church developed a saying, right? Hate the sin and not the sinner. Oh, but what about Psalms 5, 4 through 5? For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers. That's people of iniquity. So he just doesn't hate things. He hates people who work iniquity. Okay, scripture. Now we have a problem. I see some little bit of faces out there. We have a problem with a God who is love. Expressing these other feelings. Not emotions. Emotions is like happiness. They can be stirred up. Feelings are constant. They're constant. And Yahweh showed me that a long time ago when my grandmother had passed, and she was gone for about a year, and it was towards the end of winter, and my grandmother at this point had gone, would go to Florida for the, like November to March and be down there with family because the cold weather bothered her. And so it was coming in towards the end of March, and my thought went, oh, Grandma will be coming back soon and then it was like oh wait a minute she's gone and Yahweh said do you still love her and I said yes he said it didn't go away no but she's gone and I understood that love is constant it, it's not an emotion it's it's straight so the, the the hate that Yahweh hates when he says I hate the Nicolaitan it's constant. He doesn't like find favor with them at some point. Now, should they repent, of course, but he knows their heart. So his feeling towards them is constant. So then I go back to the question, what is this joy of Yahweh that gives me strength? So let's look at Proverbs 23, 24. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. Did you hear me? The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. And he that beget a wise child shall have joy of him. Let's go back to verse 15. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. So when we, you know, we, we went through the book of Proverbs some time ago, and we realized, what is this? Talking about two peoples, right? The fool and the wise. The fool says in his heart, there is no God, and he chases after his own ways. Right? Sister Denise talked, that's, what a, that's, that's a fool. He believes there is no God, and he sets up his own ways that are right in his own eyes. He's following after what's right. But the wise believe there is a God, 
and chases after him. They do the, does the things of Yahweh. So he's saying here, now, you know, this is Solomon, and we pretty much put it in and say, you know, the father. Oh, Solomon's talking to his kids. Yeah, I don't know. Sure, yeah, probably. He had a lot of kids, you know, because he had a lot of wives and women. But if you read this, there was a lot of prophetic word in the Proverbs. You know, we can give some prophetic word in Psalms, but when you look at the Proverbs, but there's a lot of prophetic word in here. So the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. So my son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice. So what is the joy of Yahweh? What's the joy of Yahweh? Me being right with him. Me being right with him causes him to rejoice. And him rejoicing gives me strength. Right? So I can do, uh, everybody familiar with geometry, you know, A equals C and B equals A, then C and A are the same. They all equal each other, right? So if, if me being right with Yahweh gives him joy and that's my strength, me doing the will of Yahweh gives me strength. When I'm right before Yahweh, doing the will of Yahweh, I am strengthened. When I am weak, I am strong. How, what does that mean? What was Paul talking about? When I do the things of Yahweh, when I put Yahweh first, when I serve Yahweh, even though I'm weak, this flesh is weak. Yeshua said it to his disciples, you cannot pray for me with, for one hour. I know the flesh is weak. So when we're doing things of ourself, we fall short. Why? Because we're weak. But the joy of Yahweh is my strength. And his joy is me being right before him. It causes his heart to rejoice. And therein is my scripture. Now, I know you all are like, how did she run that together? Because the scripture says that it's all given by inspiration. Like Solomon just wasn't talking to his kids. It, he's inspired. It's inspired by Yahweh. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for, re, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of Yahweh may be perfect. So it's all so I can run them together. Why? Because it's all given for Yahweh. Yahweh is our father and we are his children. The joy of Yahweh is a righteous, wise child. If Yah be for us, who can be against us? And he's for me. When I'm for him, he is for me. Uh, uh, that one line, it's like that one line in... Brother Leo's song, you chased after me, now I'm after you. Because you first love me, I love you. Because he is for me, I am for him. Because he gave it up for me. He loved me so that I can be able to love him. And when I do it, he rejoices. Think of your children. And we can always go to Pastor Anthony and his wife because they have a wide selection of children, right? So we've got a lot of, of a wide variety there. And, and, and most of them are here in the church. And even though they're in the church, we can see their differences, you know, the things that they excel in. And we, we get to see firsthand in the church. And I'm sure there's a lot more that we don't know because we're not at home with them. But we can see, when we put that in equation, when we look at our children, who puffs us up? Who gets the gift? Who gets, who, who, who? The one who I'm proud of. The one that makes me rejoice. 
the one I sit and talk about. I got four sons, and I talk about William the most. Because I, not that he's like above all of them or anything, but he serves Yahweh, and he's a good son. He's a good son. Now, he's a good son, not because he's good, but because he's in the house of Yahweh. And that makes him a good son, which, ladies, will make him a good husband because he's in the house of Yahweh. Not because he's special in, in, in of, you know, like, you know, but because he's in the house of Yahweh, he's a good son. And he gives Yahweh great pleasure. Therefore, Yahweh favors him. Mark is favored. You know, as a young, and that doesn't mean that we have everything that we want. Because good parenting doesn't give a child everything they want. Because good parenting knows what could hurt a child. What could distract a child? What could lead them into harm's way? That tells them, oh, that's not a good friend. Yahweh is a good parent. He's a good parent. So let's step back a little bit and go back into verse 8. Because I think this reading is uh, very intense when we, like, look at it. So they read in the book of the law of God. Yahweh distinctly, like they are focusing on the characteristics of Yahweh. They're focusing on Yahweh. And they gave the sense, right? So it meant that they didn't just read it, right? And caused them to understand their reading. So somebody was, and it wasn't just Ezra that was reading. He started the reading. That group six on one side, seven on the other, was they took turns. And they were expounding on the word. They want to make sure the people, what? That's what it says here. And cause them to understand the reading. Make sure they got it. This is what we do in class, what each of the pastors do when they're up here teaching or preaching, is to try to make sure that we pass on, not just read the word, but give understanding, right? And Nehemiah, which is the governor, and Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, see, it said right there, and taught the people. I didn't just, you know, insert that said unto all the people, this day is holy unto Yahweh your God. Why is this day holy unto Yahweh? See, y'all didn't pay attention to the reading. It's the Feast of Trumpets. It's the first day of the seventh month. That's what it said earlier up in the chapter. It's the first day of the seventh month. So he's saying, this day is holy unto Yahweh your God. Mourn not nor weep. Now, he's not saying don't mourn or weep because the feast day. Okay, that's not what he's saying. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. What happened to them? They heard the word and it was expounded unto them and they knew they had not been right before their God. And so they wept, and if you go back into the earlier verses, it said they came together in oneness. They were single-minded. They came to hear the word of Yahweh. Note that they were the ones that requested that it be read. They went to Ezra. We want to hear from Yahweh. And so then they read. And all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto Yahweh your God. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. The joy of Yahweh is found on the road to restoration. 
The, the people's heart, when they heard the word, they repented. They were mournful. They were sorry. And Jer Nehemiah is quick to let them know, Yahweh has forgiven you. So now go, eat, enjoy the feast. Enjoy the feast. Yahweh convicts us of sin, and often our first reaction is guilt and shame. But those feelings never come from Yahweh. Ezra, the scribe, gathered all the people. He read to them from Yahweh's book, and skilled ministers explained the words and their meaning to the people. That was part of the Levite's job, always, from when the priesthood was established. That they were not just to teach it, they were to teach it. They were to teach it so that the people knew what was proper sacrifices to bring, what was the feast days to keep. They were to expound on it. That was their job from the beginning. Nehemiah 8.8 8 says, they read from the book, from the law of Yahweh, clearly and gave the sense so that the people understood. Note who the people were. They weren't just the men. It was the men and the women and children who could understand if they had an understanding. So I'm not gonna put an age group on that because you would decide, some of us have children that understand quite young, they comprehend. And so you would decide that, but it would be, it was the men and the women and these children who had understanding. Once the people understood, really understood, they wept. They were convicted of their sin and, the wept, and they wept with repentance. Yahweh's word was opening their eyes to the way they had failed him, but Nehemiah was quick to remind them of who Yahweh is. Maybe they read a portion, and it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of Yahweh thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that Yahweh thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. Can you see blessings chasing you down? I said, that's what it said, and overtake thee. They're chasing you down. But Yahweh's sending his blessings, and you can't escape them. They're chasing you down. You're going to have the blessings of Yahweh. Whether you want it or not, if you're obedient to him, they're going to overtake you. They're going to overtake you. You can't escape. Not that we want to, but you can't. You can't escape. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of thy God, this is Deuteronomy 28, just before he lists the blessings, if you follow, if you obey. Maybe he, that was part of what they read. And Nehemiah is quick to remind them, you're forgiven because you, you, you are diligently. Remember, it was them. They wanted to hear from Yahweh. They were diligent, and they heard the voice of Yahweh. Maybe it was Nehemiah quoting, if my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their lands. We have to understand what was going on with Israel at this time. You know, Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, Pastor Jeremiah did all the, went through all the books and did great explanations of the history and time frame and seeing Yeshua and all of them. But it's some of the facts, not just seeing Yeshua in them, but some of the facts and the timeline and understanding uh, is, was, is very helpful in when we're interpreting the scripture. So Ezra and Nehemiah are kind of one book. So it, Judah had been in captivity, and Yahweh raises up a king who out the blue just decides to let the people, not let them go. They're not free, free. He's still gonna have dominion over them, but they could go back home and they could build their house, build their temple to their God. He just gave them free reign. 
Now, they just didn't all pack up and leave. They kind of went out in waves. And the first wave is in Ezra, and it's mentioned in Nehemiah, the list of who went first, you know, the lineage. And they went and they set up their little tents for home. And the first thing they do in Ezra is build the temple. First thing they did was build an altar so they could offer sacrifices and, and rejoice and give Yahweh his due. But they were troubled on all sides. People were not happy that Israel was being reestablished. And so after some time, they finally get the temple done because the king in, 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 interferes or in, I don't want to say, yeah, intervenes. That's the word I'm looking for, not interfere. Intervenes and tells the other nations, nope, keep your place. I gave them permission and to do what they're doing. And then some time passes again, and people go back to Babylon, maybe to visit their families, and Nehemiah asks, what's going on? And so he's not happy about the people being troubled still. So he goes and investigates, and he sees, well, you know, we need to build a wall. You know, so, so his focus is on building a wall to help keep the people in the city and the temple safe. That, that's his, so this is what's going on here with the, the people. So, you know, they, you know, in Ezra, when they finished the temple, the old folk <clears throat> who remembered Solomon's temple boohooed. They just boohooed. Oh, it's just not as good as Solomon's. Oh, Boohoo, you know. And the other people were like, the younger people were like, we got a temple. Like, this king let us come and build a temple. And so Yahweh fussed at the old folk for, and then gave a word of prophecy saying, wait until you see the one that's going to come. You think Solomon's was grand? Wait until the one that's going to come. So it's like, forget about what this one looks like and what Solomon's look like. There's a better coming yet. There's a better one coming yet. So the people were here struggling, and their hearts turned to Yahweh, and they wanted to hear the word. They wanted to hear the word. They wanted Ezra to open the word and read the word. trying to use the book instead of the tablet. Something special about the book. Something special about using the book. Ah, uh, let's see. We'll start with Who shall separate us from the love of Messiah? Shall trouble Hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Yahweh that is in Messiah, Yeshua, our Lord. When I, when Yahweh I become the joy of Yahweh. See, this is for the people of Yahweh. When I, we, are the joy of Yahweh, nothing can separate me from him. Nothing can separate me from him. So although there may be hardships, you know, life likes to bat us around a little bit. The devil likes to put us, try to put us off course. We deal with our flesh. 
right? It's just not the devil who made me do it. I got to deal with my flesh who yearns for the things of the world, the devil, and life. Life who just causes me to get depressed, get discouraged, want to quit. I'll tell you what, I wanted to quit sometime, but I never wanted to quit after I had the epiphany. After I knew, after I had this, see, I wanted to quit, but when, but when our, every life was beating me up so bad and I grabbed this and said, this is all I got. Since then, was no quitting. Y'all might get on my nerves, but I ain't quitting. You know, because that surface, you getting on my nerves is working, it's the surface thing. Because the love is for real. The love is for real. You know, that's what causes us to tarry on. That's what causes us to pursue on. That's what causes us to hold on. Hold on and not give up hope. Even for those that have, you know, separated themselves from us, it causes us to hold on is the love. Not that because I could, you know, with some of these people, we could just cut them right off and go on our merry way. But the love of Yahweh who desire that all would be saved is in me. It's in me. And I can't get rid of it unless I get rid of Yahweh. But I had an epiphany and I won't let go. And I found out that the joy of Yahweh is my strength. So as long as I do right by him, he is my strength. He is my strength. So even though I may want to in my flesh, I can't. I can't because it's past the point of no return. I'm past the point of no return. I want you to know there is a point. And sometimes in our youth, that's why they go and dabble because they haven't reached that point of no return. They haven't been fully persuaded. They haven't had their epiphany that if, if I let go of Yahweh, I have nothing. That Yahweh is all there is. That Yahweh is, his joy is my strength. That isn't just, that's a, a, um, a truth. An infallible truth. The joy of Yahweh is your strength. And that's for anybody and everybody. But we read what makes Yahweh joyous. Being right. A wise son. A righteous son. Causes the father to rejoice. But the statement is for everybody. You just got to come the right way. You got to know how to reach the Father's heart. We sing songs, don't we? I know how to reach your heart. Your heart. I'm reaching your heart. Your heart. Not you reaching my heart. Me reaching your heart. Because the joy of Yahweh is my strength. Why this word? You know, I struggled. And then it came, and it's like, oh, it's a good word. It's an encouraging word. But why this word? Why this word? And so Sister Denise, not too long ago, a little bit ago, brought a word on the spirit of heaviness. And she was talking uh, mostly about her personal experience with this spirit of heaviness. So I want you to know that that was Yahweh chose you to go through that so that you could get delivered from it, but then bring the word. See, not everybody could go through that. So it's selective. Note that, and, and I said that some time ago, that Yahweh picks, right? If he's ordering us our steps, he picks our valleys. They're designed for us. Because everybody can't go through your valley. They won't come out. They'll be stuck in the valley. 
They won't come out. So that was purposed full in, in your life because Yahweh knew you. You knew him well enough to know this is not normal. And so you sought what's going on. And then Yahweh delivered you and then gave you a, a word to share with the congregation. Yet, some people didn't hear that word. Maybe it's because it seems that that spirit of heaviness comes and goes. You know, I'm dying today, I'm up tomorrow. I'm having a good week, having a bad month. You know, it comes and goes, so you don't claim this spirit of heaviness. The coming and going is about you. It's not the coming and going. You are coming and going. See, it's, it's not the problem or the issue that's coming and going. It's you are coming and going in your walk and holding on to the truth that Yahweh has given to you. You are the one that's coming and going. Not this good day, bad day, but you are. We just had a word that Yahweh brought forth, and he started with a question. Is there anything too hard for him? He said he was the resurrection and the life. He is the deliverer, he is the healer, and other stuff I can't all remember. But each one of those, he said, have you not read in my word? Have you not read in my word. See, I'm a deliverer. And I have to prove it to you. Have you not read in my word? But everyone here has a testimony of deliverance. There's testimony of healing here, but Yahweh doesn't have to prove it. Have you not read in my word? Have you not read in my word? Ezra stood up and opened the book and read the word, read the word, the word, the word, the word. We're picking and choosing what we listen to and we can't run the scriptures together and we, we're going in and out. No, you're going in and out. You want victory, claim the word. Claim the word, it's the word which is Yeshua, right? And that word put on flesh and dwelt among us. Stop making these separations between Yeshua, the word, Yahweh. It's all one. It's all one. When you are a wise child, a believer, who believe and follow, then the Father rejoices and his joy gives you strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.